In the last video, we saw how the Keynesian cross could help us visualize an increase in government spending, which was a shift in our aggregate planned expenditure line right over here. And we saw how the actual change, the actual increase in output, if you are a if you if you if you take all of the assumptions that we took in this, that the actual change in output and aggregate income was larger than the change in government spending. And so you might say, oh, okay, you know, Keynesian thinking, this is very left wing, this is spending the government's growing larger right here. I'm more conservative. I do. I'm not a believer in Keynesian thinking. And the reality is you actually might be. Whether you're on the right or the left, although Keynesian economics, it tends to be poo-pooed more by the, the right and embraced more by the left, most of the, the mainstream right policies, especially in the US, have actually been very Keynesian. They just haven't been by manipulating this variable right over here. For example, when people talk about expanding the economy by lowering taxes, they are a Keynesian when they say that. Because if we were to rewind and we go back to our original function, so if we don't do this, if we go back to just having our G here, so if we, do, if we go back to just having our G, so we're now back on this orange line, our original planned expenditure, you could, based on this model right over here, also shift it up by lowering taxes. If you, if you change your taxes to be taxes minus, minus some delta in taxes, the reason why this is going to shift the whole curve up is because you're multiplying this whole thing, you're multiplying this whole thing by a negative number, by negative C1. C1, your marginal propensity to consume, we're assuming is positive. You there's a negative out here. So when you multiply it by a negative, when you multiply a decrease by a negative, so this is a negative change in taxes, then this whole thing is going to shift up again. So you would actually shift up, you would actually shift up in this case and depending on what the actual magnitude of the change in taxes are, but you would actually shift up. And the amount that you would shift up, I don't want to make my graph too messy, so this would be our new ex aggregate planned expenditures. But the amount you would move up is by this coefficient out here, C C1, negative C1 times negative delta t. So your change, the amount that you would move up is negative C1 times negative delta t if we assume delta t is positive. And so you actually have a C1 delta t. The negatives cancel out. So that's actually how much it, it would actually move up. And it's also Keynesian when you say, if we increase taxes, that will lower aggregate output. Because if you increase taxes, if you increase taxes, you're the, now all of a sudden this is a positive, this is a positive, and then you would shift the curve by that much. And so you would actually shift the curve down. And then you would get to a, you would actually get to a lower equilibrium GDP. So this really isn't a difference between right, uh, right-leaning fiscal policy or left-leaning fiscal policy. And everything that I've talked about so far at the end of the last video and this video really has been fiscal policy. This has been the spending lever of fiscal policy, and this right over here has been kind of the taxing lever of fiscal policy. If you believe either of those can affect aggregate output, then you are essentially subscribing to the Keynesian model. Now one thing that I did touch on a little bit in the last video is we're, whatever our change is, however much we shift this aggregate planned expenditure curve, the change in our the change in our output actually was some multiple of that. And what I want to do now is to actually show you mathematically that it actually all works out that the multiple is actually the multiplier. So if we go back to our original, and this will just get a little bit mathy right over here. So I'm just going to rewrite it all. So we have our planned expenditure. Just to kind of re redig our minds into the actual into the actual expression, the planned expenditure is equal to the marginal propensity to co to consume times aggregate income, and then you're going to have all this business right over here, and we're just going to go with the original one, not what I changed, and all this business. Let's just call that B. That'll just make it simple for us to manipulate this. So let's just call all of this business right over here B. We can substitute that back in later. We know, we know that an economy is in equilibrium when planned expenditures is equal to output. That is an economy in equilibrium. So let's set this. Let's set planned expenditures equal to equal to aggregate output, which is the same thing as aggregate expenditures with the same thing as aggregate income. And so now we can just solve for our equilibrium income. We can just solve for it. So you get y is equal to c1 times y 
plus b, this is going to look very familiar to you in a second, subtract c1 times y from both sides. y minus c1y, that's the left-hand side now. On the right-hand side, obviously, if we subtract c1y, it's going to go away. And then we have that is equal to b. And then we can factor out, we can factor out the aggregate income from this. So y times 1 minus c1 is equal to b. And then we divide both sides by 1 minus c1. 1 minus c1. And we get, that cancels out. We get, I'll rewrite it, I'll write it right over here. We get, we get, and now you get a little bit of a drum roll. Aggregate income, our equilibrium, equilibrium aggregate income, aggregate output, aggregate, aggregate GDP is going to be equal to, is going to be equal to, I'll just 1 over 1 minus c1 times b. Remember, b was all this business up here. Now what was one, what is, what is this? You might remember this, or if you haven't seen the video, you might want to watch the video on the multiplier. This c1 right over here is our marginal propensity to consume. Marginal propensity to consume. One minus our marginal propensity to consume is actually, and I don't think I've actually referred to it before. Actually, let me rewrite it here just so you know the, the term. So C1 is equal to our marginal propensity, is equal to our marginal propensity to consume. So for example, if this is if this is 30% or 0.3, that means for every incremental dollar of disposable income I get, I want to spend 30 cents of it. Now, one minus C1. 1 minus c1, you could view this as your marginal propensity to save. If I'm going to spend 30%, then that means I'm going to save 70%. So this is just saying I'm going to save 1 minus c1. If, if I'm spending 30% of that incremental disposable dollar, then I'm going to save 70% of it. So this whole thing, so this is a marginal propensity to consume. This, whole, this entire denominator is a marginal propensity to save. And then 1 over that, and so 1 over 1 minus c1, which is the same thing as 1 over the marginal propensity to save. That is the multiplier. We saw that a few videos ago. If you take this infinite geometric series, if we just think through how money spends, if I spend some money on, on some good or service, the person who has that, that money as income is going to spend some fraction of it based on their marginal propensity to consume. And we're assuming that it's constant throughout the economy at all income levels for this model right over here. And then they'll spend some of it. And then the person that they spend the money on, they're going to spend some fraction. When you keep adding all of the, that infinite series up, you actually get this multiplier right over here. So this is equal to, this is equal to our equal to our multiplier. So for example, if B gets shifted up, if B gets shifted up by any amount, let's say B gets shifted up. And it could get shifted up by changes in any of this stuff right over here. Net exports can change. Planned investment can change. It can be shifted up or down. The impact on the impact on GDP is going to be whatever that shift is times the multiplier. Times the multiplier. We saw it before. If for example, if for example, if C1 is equal to is equal to 0 0.6. Then that means that the, for every incremental uh, disposable dollar, people will spend 60% of it. That means that the marginal propensity to save, for, to save is equal to 40%. They're going to save 40% of any incremental disposable dollar. And then the multiplier, the multiplier, is going to be one over that. It's going to be one over 0 0.4, which is the same thing as one over two fifths, which is the same thing as five halves which is the same thing as 2.5. So for example, in this situation, we just saw that that y, the equilibrium y is going to be 2.5 times whatever all of this other business is. So if we change b by let's say a billion dollars, and maybe we change maybe we 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 if we increase b by a billion dollars, we might increase b by a billion dollars by increasing government spending by a billion dollars or maybe having this whole term this whole term, including the negative right over here, become less negative by a billion dollars. Maybe we have planned investment increase by a billion dollars. And that could actually be done a little bit with tax policy too by letting companies maybe depreciate their assets faster. If we can increase net exports by a billion dollars, essentially any way that we increase B by a billion dollars, that'll increase GDP by $2.5 billion, 2.5 times our change in B. So we could write this down. This way, our change in y, our change in y, 
is going to be 2.5 times our change in b. Or another way to think about it, when you write the expression like this, you see if you said y is a function of b, then you would say, look, the slope is 2.5. So change in y, change in y over change in b is equal to 2.5. But I just wanted to write this to show you that this isn't some magical voodoo what we're doing. This is what we looked at it visually when we look at the Keynesian cross, but this is really just describe, describing the same multiplier effect that we saw in previous videos and where we actually derived the actual multiplier.